welcome to the first show of The High Road with Drake and Serena Travis. We are coming to you from Los Angeles, California. That's right, Drake. We're bringing you the cure for cultural chaos. What are some topics that our viewers can expect, Drake? Well, this is a globally focused talk show. We're covering pertinent topics, faith, family, politics, education, entertainment, technology, just to name a few. We're talking to leaders and celebrities. We'll highlight some humor and cover the issues important to family and people who want to restore values. We present more than just the facts. We will bring you the truth. Today we have a great show lined up for you. <laughs> we have a lighter side segment. And Drake, I heard we had a really sharp guest today. Oh, we do, yes. We'll be talking to uh, Brad Dacus. He is the founder of Pacific Justice Institute. He's faced down opponents like the ACLU in debates. <laughs> And he's taken on school boards, officials, lawmakers across the U.S. in defense of citizens' religious rights and liberties. Later on in the show, I'll join Drake and Brad to talk about the new transgender laws that are making historic changes in your child's school. You'll need to fasten your seatbelt for this one. Let's start with the lighter side. Sounds great. <laughs> on the lighter side of life, Serena and I had quite a year in 2014 with four weddings among our children. That's right, four. Yes, the wallet is getting a lot lighter these days. <laughs> the, first, the first wedding was February. You know, walking one's daughter down the aisle is, uh, it's enchanting. And after I uh, gave her away, uh, she put something in my hand, and I went down to sit, sit next to my wife, and I couldn't wait to see what this memento my, my daughter was. She gave me, I opened my hand, and it was my credit card. <laughs> nice to have that back. <laughs> you know, uh, our... Uh, our President uh, Barack Hussein Obama has really been tough with Russian President Vladimir Putin. It appears that Obama threatened that if Russian President doesn't withdraw his troops from the Ukraine, he's going to stop following him on Twitter. <laughs> he then went on to say that if Putin invades any more countries, he'll unfriend him on Facebook. <laughs> now, I'll bet Putin is seriously considering his next move. And, and, and hey, it teaches all of us a lesson. Don't upset a community organizer. And speaking of the community disorganizer, oh. in a recent poll, Obama came in as the fifth best president. Obama agrees. He says he's fifth best. So, Number one, it was a tie between George Washington and Ronald Reagan. 17 presidents came in a tie for second. Another 23 came in a tie for third. Coming in fourth was Jimmy Carter. And finally at number five was President Obama. Okay, 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 folks. <laughs> That's all for the lighter side. Now let's go into overdrive and, and um, welcome our first guest. Six pastors in Texas have their notes subpoenaed because their biblical message is against politically correct culture. Meanwhile, a Black Panther leads a parade through the streets chanting, kill the cops. Nothing happens to him. These examples represent a new kind of tolerance and a stifling of free speech that is the new norm in America. Today we have Brad Dacus, founder of Pacific Justice Institute. He faces off with the ACLU. He's a champion for parental rights and freedom of speech. Welcome, Brad. Oh, it's great to be on the program, Drake. <laughs> Thank is, you. It is good to have you. Um, you know, along with this example in Texas, what is happening to freedom of speech in the public marketplace? Yeah, it's freedom of speech is being narrowed with a filter. And the filter says you're free to communicate. You have to have freedom of speech so long as society agrees with it or the new culture agrees with it, which obviously is not freedom of speech. You, you can't have um, you know, a one-way tolerance. Uh, one-way tolerance isn't tolerance at all. It's, it's tyranny. And yet, that is what we see being displayed. And, and of course, your example was an excellent one out of Houston. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like uh, tolerance applies to Christians especially. They have to be tolerant. Right. But it seems like nobody else has to be tolerant. Right. And, and you know, am, it, I, am I smelling that right? You're or? exactly right. You know, the interesting thing is, is that, you know, generally speaking, Christians have a reputation of tolerance, of, of love and compassion. Oh, yeah, yeah. Even if they don't agree with someone, and they may strongly disagree with someone, mm -hmm. uh, they still give you generally respect, love, and compassion. Uh, so it's, it is a clearly a, a, a double standard, and uh, people of faith are being targeted more and more on a number of different grounds when it comes to, to, the, to because of their speech. Mm -hmm. well, not, now, why is freedom of speech so important to our culture? Uh, our culture is, is developed by what is allowed to be expressed and practiced. If people are only allowed to believe internally, 
what they believe and not allowed to share it or express their ideas, then culture will radically change in a very short while to just the opinions that people are allowed to express. So what's, so if, if, what's lost if it's gone? Uh, what's lost is uh, the ability for our society to have the, co the conscience that it has. Uh, people of faith have all have long served to be a, a strong role model in terms of conscience, whether it was in terms of the, the Revolutionary War, whether it was ending slavery, whether it was the Civil Rights Movement with Martin Luther King mm -hmm. um, Jr. It, it's so important that, that we be able to, to play that role and have a conscience. Let me give you another example. is uh, dealing with universities, for example. We have a, a gentleman representing a professor. Uh, he was fired from Cal State Northridge because he wrote a peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer review article mm -hmm. on a, a, a triceratops fossil he found that had soft tissue in it. And because that didn't agree with the political <laughs> correctness, <laughs> this man was fired yeah. and we're representing him. Yeah. And we don't want uh, people with a faith purged from our universities. And that's a classic example. Who's dictating what can be discussed and can't be discussed? Yeah. Who says, hey, I'm the boss. Let's talk about what I say we talk about. And you be quiet and you... Who, who's, who is this? Yeah, well, I would have to say the, the private sector um, really isn't so as bad as the public, the government sector. And let me give you an example. Like, for example, in public schools, uh, you know, a lot of public schools are controlled to, to a considerable degree by, uh, by people with a different philosophy, the, the, the unions, the teachers' unions, et cetera. Uh -huh. and, uh, and they come down with policies and attitudes and philosophies that really impact kids. And by impacting kids and their speech and attitudes, uh, will have a big impact in the long term. Let me give you a quick example. Uh, Loomis, California. We at Pacific Justice Institute defended a young girl. She was in, I think it was sixth grade, and she invited two of her friends to a church event. She had given each a flyer for a church event. Oh, I do that. I've done it to thousands, tens of thousands of people. Right. Well, this young girl had to write an apology three times before her parents finally contacted us, and then we challenged the school district. They wouldn't change their position. We had to file a lawsuit and I'm pleased to report we got the, the, the matter resolved and settled nicely. But that's a classic, and we have many other examples like no, that. What, uh, hate speech. Something doesn't sit right with that phrase. It sounds like a misnomer. What is hate speech? Oh, it's a big misnomer. It's uh, a mis Okay, it is oh, a misnomer. Oh, okay. absolutely. Uh, because uh, hate speech is being practically applied as anyone who has uh, beliefs that don't agree with the PC movement. Specifically, if you believe something is wrong, not that you believe someone is is bad, but just you believe something is wrong. Mm -hmm. For example, um, if, uh, you know, if you exp express your, your, your viewpoint and say, well, I think, I think this is wrong, I don't agree with that. Uh, you know, I, I believe that, uh, that, that marriage is between a man and a woman. Even though you're giving that person you're talking to respect, um, you're, you're, you're treating them fairly and nicely, uh, then you're, you're, it's deemed to be hate speech simply because your beliefs don't match up with that person's beliefs. And uh, oh, we, see wow. that we see people losing their jobs all, over, all across the country simply because they express their values and beliefs, not because they're calling they're names against, wow. or attacking anyone in a personal <laughs> way. <laughs> wow, thank you, Brad. Yeah, up next in, in our second segment, we are talking with Brad about transgender laws. I'm Dr. Drake, and it's time to cut the nonsense. Let's talk about family. It's lunacy the government's aim to redefine the nuclear family. We say it's a father and mother and their children. There are extended family situations, and that's healthy. But last I heard, the U.S. government has dozens of definitions for family. Let's remind them, nuclear family. With all their lurid policies of late, they're basically saying, nuke the family. More on this later. <laughs> Church and state. That phrase was never a civic truth, but was used to build resentment against churches. And the phrase stuck. The push today is to marginalize all Christian expression. The lowdown is the state wants the church in a lurch 
with no influence. The clincher, the state thinks it's the church. Come kneel before them for sustenance, shelter, and guidance. And the government plays the Pied Piper for religious diversity. This keeps the matter cluttered and neutral. The religions cancel each other. The real goal of church and state ploy is keep God out. The government definition for religion is nonsense. Incidentally, whatever the government does for public assistance, the church does 10 times better for one-tenth the cost. That means 100 times more efficiently. More on this later. Public education. George Washington's advice was finally heeded in 1799, the year he died. He had urged for over 20 years that there be compulsory religious education, or he warned this experiment in freedom would not work. So the public school system was formed for the purpose of teaching literacy and religious instruction. There was one textbook in 1799, the Holy Bible. 99.9% .9 of America could read, and America was reading the Bible. In six short years, spiritual revival had broken out full scale. In this second great awakening, the colonies were jubilant as jails and courts fell vacant. Domestic disputes were few, gunfights ceased, neighborhoods were safe again, families were happy. What's a divorce? Alcoholism and suicide? Very rare. How would that report compare to today? And how are the public schools? Well, the prayer's out since 1962. Bibles left soon after, and they are in shambles. Chaos. Education is not happening. Kids can't think, read, add, write, or focus. They're apathetic, confused, and allergic to work. As for literature, anything goes. And all is presented. The lurid, the horrific, the pagan, and worse. It's all at the schools. The Bible? Well... It's banned. Is anyone making any connections here? What kids are and aren't taught is related to the fact that they are adulterated, yet they don't grow into adults that enter society as productive citizens. The National Education Association aims to secularize and raise up contrarians who are anti-family, ill-sacred, and entitled malcontents. And the NEA is vehemently against reformation. This is unsustainable nonsense. You tired of the nonsense? <laughs> Send your ideas to feedback at thehighroadshow.com. back with Dr. Brad Dacus, founder of Pacific Justice Institute, and we are joined by my wife, Serena. Transgender laws are coming to a public school near you soon. Are you ready? In this segment, we're talking about the conflict of gender identity pitted against constitutional privacy rights of students. Thank you for coming back with us, Brad. Good to have you. Um, what, is, what do these new transgender laws involve? Yeah. They're very alarming uh, because it's, it's a trend. It's not just an isolation of uh, just one state. Uh, but specifically, states like California have enacted laws or in the process of enacting laws that say that a boy who says that he feels like he's a girl on the inside has the ability to use the, the girl's locker rooms. The, the, girl's, the freedom to. The freedom, yeah. Locker rooms, showers, bathrooms, and vice versa. The girls with the same with the boys. Now... Mind you, Drake, there are, are pe young people out there who have gender identity dysphoria. It's a mental condition, okay? It's not a biological condition. It's a mental condition. They need love. They need compassion. They need counseling, without question. But, I mean, we, we cannot victimize a 13- or 14-year-old girl in a locker room. She's just taken off her clothes. She's very t timid. She's going to get into the showers. And in comes, prances in a 16-year-old biological boy who takes off his clothes in front of her. This girl, yeah. is, she's visually violated, and that is not acceptable. And yeah. yet that is the trend, yeah. and we're seeing it play out in case-by-case case example in California and other parts of the country. I did hear something about Colorado. Is What's going on there? Yes. Uh, this is a, a classic where uh, in a small school uh, located outside of Colorado Springs, in a uh, place called Florence, uh, you have a, a, a young teenage boy, 
and he decides that he wants to dress like a girl, and presumably he has gender identity dysphoria, to no fault of his own, uh, but the school decides to allow him not only to dress like a girl, but to use the girls' bathrooms and the locker rooms and the showers. And we at Pacific Justice Institute uh, are, are defending these girls and, and working to, to get this corrected. Uh, because And it's, uh, so it's the girls that have asked for help regarding oh, this? Absolutely. Okay. In fact, we yeah. even have a short video on YouTube uh, with over 60,000 people have already seen it where we're interviewing the girls. We're letting them tell their story. And it's, wow. it's so convicting when you see what goes on in a young girl's heart and mind when she realizes that she's being visually violated mm. by a teenage boy and there's nothing being done now, about I've it. I've also either. heard some articles where it is saying that, you know, maybe that's just kind of an isolated case, you know, that really right. this is, some teachers are saying this law has really helped them and it's really helping them with these students. Mm. What do you say to that? Yeah. Uh, for, first off, it's not isolated, uh, unfortunately. Uh, we have reports that uh, over 300 transgenders uh, exist kids with gender identity dysphoria in just the San Francisco school district alone, supposedly. Uh, we have e examples in school districts that we, like Irvine, for example, where you wouldn't expect it necessarily culturally, uh, but it's popping up and it's being facilitated and encouraged because of these kinds of laws. Uh, and, it's, and it's not something that the kids are just, you know, not impacted by. We have kids now who don't want to take showers for fear that the opposite sex is going to come in and stare at them. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that is a, a serious uh, violation of their, their rights, their privacy, their yeah. dignity. And, and that's what true civil rights are about, is respecting the, the dignity and privacy of individuals. So, so what are the implications to society beyond the schools? I mean, because these people always start working in the schools, the young people. What's the implications for society? Right, and, that, and that's a, a really good question. Uh, the reality is that this is a part of a movement to gender neutralize society. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. by doing that, we're going to have uh, a lot of problems that come into place, for example, with the family and the family unit. Uh, becomes very difficult when you have uh, gender identities blurred, gender mm -hmm. responsibilities, understanding of, mm -hmm. of, of inter interrelations. So the, the family unit itself is going to be weakened and attacked if this is successful. And then we also have a, a different standard of values. Uh, when we have this, this new attitude that you can be whatever gender you want and have different kinds of relationships, it takes the, the, the premise of, of right and wrong in terms of the nat laws mm -hmm. of nature and, yeah. and, and, and uh, totally out the window. So it's going to play itself out in a, in a degrading of our, our values as well as a degrading of the institution of the family unit so itself. So then what is a better way of handling people who are suffering from this transgender issue? And are they suffering? Right. Well, they are, definitely. They are, okay. They definitely are. Now, the good news is, uh, that it's, if, if left alone, most of them will work through it on their own without even counseling, uh, assuming they're not confused and encouraged by a school district. Uh, over over 70%, one study shows over 70% of the kids in elementary school that have gender identity dysphoria work it through on their own. Hmm. Uh, and it, it's important, though, that they, they, they provide counseling, that we give them uh, love and respect, not, no bullying or harassment. That, that's not productive, uh, and that should not be allowed in public schools in any way, shape, or form. Uh, but if it's not addressed and it's encouraged, the yeah. sad truth is, and this is, this is terrible, but the, the average transgender will not live to see their 30th birthday because depression is not resolved. Even if they have the surgery, it's not resolved. And that's why John Hopkins University Medical School uh, med uh, Hospital refuses to do these kind of surgeries anymore because surgery is not the answer. Hormone therapy is not the answer for a mental condition. Wow. 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 That's really and, and great to hear like those. That uh, information. That's good. And it sounds like it's, help it's, a lot of people. We're, we're, we're about out of time, but it sounds like it's still being enforced. They're, they're still trying oh, to. It's being enforced in California. Yeah, we okay. at Pacific Justice are litigating wow. it to get it on the ballot. Wow. And of course, uh, it's, it's coming to other states across the country. Okay. Uh, we, uh, love and compassion for all the students yeah. sure. compels us to do nothing less than to stand up to this horrific yeah. piece well, of legislation. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Brad. Brad. Thank you, you. you know, we can't take our freedoms and liberties for granted. And that is why we need organizations like the Pacific Justice Institute and extraordinary men like Brad Degas. And it's why Serena and I bring you The High Road each week.
Well, welcome to Global Connection. Basically, in this portion of the show, we have three minutes or less to solve the world's problems. No pressure, right? I think we'll definitely have some great discussions. For today's topic, let's talk about what happens to Olympic stadiums when the games are over. Since the modern age of Olympics, we have utilized around 50 Olympic facilities worldwide. But today, many of these are just run down and abandoned. So what is the solution for the world's sports-generated so-called white elephants? Serena, let's start with you. Any thoughts? Oh, yeah, definitely. I think that the Olympics should go back to Greece, at least the Summer Olympics, because the Olympics are supposed to give the host city an economic boost, and uh, we definitely know that Greece needs that. So, hey, let's just go back to Greece. 50, 100 years, let's just take some time and rebuild it. So that way we could just reuse all these facilities instead of wondering what we're going to do with them. Absolutely. Just keep improving. So just In send, Greece. <laughs> send all the athletes to Greece every, every Olympics. Okay. Yeah. Jake, what do you think? Well, the overarching thought is the dilapidation. I was watching the Olympics in the 60s, and I've watched them every, every one since. Most of these stadiums look like a bomb went off. It, it, it's horrible. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's sad. So if you want to take it back to Greece, that's okay, have a plan. It goes back to Greece for a century, have a century-long plan. These cities that present themselves, at, well, we want to host it, what's your plan? You gonna build a boondoggle? What are you gonna do with it later? Hmm. Um, they could make temporary structures. You know, London made a temporary stadium and they dismantled it uh, starting Monday after the Olympics ended. That worked, so yeah, just don't, just don't leave this basically have a plan. Yeah, that's definitely the idea with the temporary structures and that way they're just not sitting there collecting graffiti, weeds growing no. on them where they just don't even know what to do with and these they things become, anymore. And they become crime lures. Oh, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. So, yeah. Unless yeah. they can reuse them in some way, mm -hmm. like you were saying, come up with a plan, maybe yeah. use those bobsled tracks for like a skateboarding ramp or something. <laughs> Water parks. <laughs> oh, yeah, you definitely like that. Water go. parks, the Lord's <laughs> will. Yeah. That would be fun. Serena, yeah. any other thoughts? Well, I was reading a book by Mark Perryman that said why the Olympics aren't good for us and how they can be, which is a real short title to start with. <laughs> And he suggested decentralizing the Olympics. In, so in order to do that, have a sport in one place continuously, just in that one sport in that one place, or spread it out over a region like Europe or something. So, so one city in the region would always be hosting gymnastics. Another city in the area would host something else. The and swimming and things that. like that, yeah. Well, that's so. definitely an idea, too. Okay. Well, there always seems to be worldwide excitement for the Olympics, but what can be done to make it a gold medal situation for everyone involved? We want to know what you think. Should the Olympics continue to travel, be stationary, or even take place across a region? Check out an article we posted on the High Road Show website and leave your comments or email your thoughts to feedback at thehighroadshow.com. That's about all the time we have today. Next time, we'll have two retired Marines, Chad Robichaud and Joseph Molas, coming on as guests. Until then, take the high road. <laughs>